This episode of Chicago's Bravest Stories brought to you by Sports and Ortho Physical Therapy. Sports and Ortho Physical Therapy knows a lot about training athletes. They train our police and fire members who are injured just like they would a professional athlete. And for 17 years, they've been doing it. We have Dahlia here, owner of Sports and Ortho Therapy. Thanks for being here, Dahlia. Thanks for having me, Vince. So what, um, Dahlia, you've, you've done a lot, speaking of athletes, you've done a lot with, um, with the fire department and police department in terms of, uh, in terms of sports. Who, who have you worked with? Yeah, so we've worked with the Blaze for the couple last couple of years. We've also worked with CFD um, Bravest, the uh, baseball team. We donate to the Battle of the Badges, to Ignite the Spirit, to yeah, Run to the Remember. Up. You know, just a lot of the organizations that uh, the police and the fire department run. Yeah, yeah. A- again, when you're when you're training someone new, they wouldn't necessarily treat um, treat us having injuries the same as you would. Uh, a 60 year old tax accountant you know our, our yeah. shoulder injuries are a little bit different huh <laughs> exactly exactly yeah you can't rehab you know a fire or police member like you would a nine-year-old grandma yeah. just doesn't work for sure <laughs> well we also know that you have a vested interest in us and you've been taking care of us and your support with our charities like ignite the spirit i know you've done the firefighter and paramedic ball you've um, definitely been a huge supporter of CFD for many years. And so we wanted to thank you and bring uh, more attention to sports and orthotherapy because you're not a commercial, you're a private practice, you're not a franchise physical therapy place. So you're really giving actual one-to-one therapy to our members. Yeah, we're, we're all about keeping in the family. We definitely want to make sure that, uh, that you know, any any family member of mine is gonna is gonna go over by you, Dahlia. That's for Aww, sure. Thank you, Corey. <laughs> I appreciate that. No, it's our pleasure. I mean, we just want to give back uh, the way that you guys give to us. So we're happy to do it. So sports and orthotherapy at sportsandorthotherapy.net and seven locations across Chicagoland. So North, thanks, Dahlia. South, east, west, east, west, yeah. northwest. Yeah. East. Thank you, guys. I appreciate being here. <laughs> thanks, Dahlia. Well, welcome back to Chicago's Bravest Stories. Today's guest is a member of the Chicago Police Department, Joe DePlachen. How do I do with that name, Joe? Hey, you're 99 percent. That's 99. Good. I'll take it. The <laughs> highest score I've ever got. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have you on the show. We got a couple stories we'd like to get to, but if you can, uh, number one, how long you've been with CPD? Just past eight years, about maybe eight and a half years, roughly. Okay, and I know that uh, we've we've kind of been talking off the air a little bit. You started going down your your history here. And we kind of stopped you. And now, if you can, kind of give us that rundown again, and then we'll, we'll kind of get into it. So take us all the way back. You, you grew up uh, on the northwest side? Yeah, um, I grew up on the northwest side. Uh, we, you know, my family was starting off poor, so my mom was a single mom, and uh, she did the best she could for us. She, you know, waitress. Uh, you know, she was a kid when she started having kids. and So we were all kids at the same time, pretty much, my mom and all of us. So we did what we could. She did what she could for And I love her, and I appreciate all that mm-hmm. she could do looking back as she a parent. She's just always working. And yeah, always working, always tr- making sure we had what we needed, all that stuff. So I don't want to, like, dis- think I'm disparaging my mom to say we grew up poor. You know, she knows it just as much as us. <laughs> uh but, you know, the, growing up in that way, you have a certain experience here in Chicago. Yeah, and uh, a mentality going along with it, too. Sure. It's uh, it's different. It's uniquely like, just like any other experience growing up. It's unique to that section of population. So, yeah, like we grew up northwest side. We moved around a lot. We kind of stayed centered around the, you know, Irving, Kimball, Irving, you know, in the north or northwest side, you know, mm-hmm. where that's kind of where, you know, we, our area was. Um yeah, which okay. wasn't wasn't particularly. Uh, I don't know. It's not the same as it is today. That's for sure. Yeah. But uh, you know, for me, growing up back then, we didn't even know we were poor. 
we just were alive and living. So right. we would hang, we run the streets with the little kids. Uh, we would do all the things that kids do. And it's, it, you know, it was, you know, knowing the statistics now of what was going on back then, it was a really dangerous time to be in that area. But, you know, we didn't know. No, we were just living life. Yeah. So uh, that was your norm. Right. That was yeah. it. But it was it was fun. You know, uh, so, yeah, growing up, you know, some issues happened with the family. We were in and out of foster care. We were at Lydia Home, actually. It's over on Irving, and I think it's Colmar or Costner or yeah. something right around there for a time. And uh, back in, in and out of, you know, foster care, you know, my brother and sister, a little bit tough times for us, but we got through that. Um, you know, we got through it. You know, we had a, my, I had a stepdad. My dad was gone, you know, from the time I can remember. But the stepdad, you know, he was he had his issues, you know, with drugs and alcohol. He was, you know, in and out of jail. We had domestic violence issues. There was a time when, you know, we even got uh, tossed out a window uh, for standing up to him for hitting my mom. Jesus. Uh, yeah, you know what? It's a tough. I thought I was a man. I think, and I call, I called my mom about this to talk to her because, you know, all this stuff was coming out. So I ran for political office, and someone basically accused me of being a. A domestic abuser. I mean, not so many words. They worded it legally, so it because right. actually somebody else. Oh no, that's not. We weren't talking about you, but it, they made it look like I had choked some uh, person with a phone card, a woman with a phone card. And now I've been my, with my wife, who's my wife. I've been with her. You know, we st- met at fifteen, <laughs> so we got wow. married at twenty. I was twenty-two. She was just turned twenty. Uh, twenty, I think, and then. So for her to this other person to say that I was a domestic abuser, you can only yeah assume there's that only one person right. That could there's be only about, right? and then my daughter, she's like, Dad, why would you choke mom with the phone cord? And oh I said, No, God. that's not what. So I it got me upset, and so I had to confront these domestic abuse and said, You know what? What the fuck? I remember. Sorry. You can do no. All right, I said yeah. I remember dealing with this shit when I was a kid, fighting. I stood the one time I stood up from, you know, I, you could tell when you were if you've ever anybody that's ever grown up in a situation like that. It's Friday, payday, your dad's not home at the same time every other day. You know what the fuck is about to go on, so it gets it starts to get going down, and I can tell, you know, my stepdad. He's my dad. He's about to get into it with my mom. My mom was the bravest woman I ever known. She would. She knew what was about to happen, but she was not going to back down either. Right. So, but, but you, but you could tell from the room that things are things are hostile. Yeah. Things are heated. Well, like I said, it's this is a routine for you. Now. It's a routine. Yeah. It's payday. He's not home on time. We know what's about to happen. Yeah. So he gets home. It's about to happen. And I, uh, I remember thinking, you know what? I'm big enough now. I'm gonna fucking. St- I'm gonna stand up to this guy. I don't like the shit that goes down. I don't, you know, being in the other room. And how here. old are you at this time? That's the thing. I was ten years old. I thought I was growing up. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> that's crazy. I, my son's my son's eleven. So mine too. Yeah. Mine too. So, now I, I'd yeah. hate to have to have to him to think of, right. You know about that. Yeah. So I remember being. And plus, ten. Vince, be careful when you get home tonight. <laughs> wait, wait for that to go. Well, you know what? Cracks, yeah. You already know, Vince. You're not the kind of person that would have to force your son to be a man at ten. And I felt. It's like ah, you gotta you gotta stop. You, you're the man of the house. You gotta stop this. You know because you and would you're always the before oldest that. of of your brothers. No, my my sister's older than me. Okay, still she tr- just tried to take care of us when yeah. all this shit was going on. But oh yeah, but I was like, no, I'm gonna do something about it. And then you know, as a ten year old dude, you don't know what to stand up to this. So I did. I stood in the middle and I said, no, not tonight. I remember I had a plate of food. Smack the shit out of my hands, smack the food out of my hands, and starts coming at everyone. Now he's after me. Yeah. And my my brother's younger than I am, three, four years. And he's trying to, now he's in the mix. Right. You know, and then all of a sudden we're on the one, you know, one goes out this window, one goes out this window. Jesus. And then, and then that's all I know. And then the next thing I see, I see him coming out with the back door, and we're all scared. He's like on the rampage. Because right. he just threw you out of a window. Right. To be fair. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we're scared. We don't know what to do. And then he ends up, you know, just taking off. But that he got he got arrested for that. My mom's like, oh, this is it. We're setting him. He got sent to, I remember he was, uh, he got a year jail time. Uh, but he spent it all in, in Cook County. I think it was six months. He had, to, you know, you got to do the half or whatever yeah. back then. or whatever. I don't even know if it's the same now. But, uh, but he had to do half. He came back different, though. Uh, yeah. 
yeah, he came back different, made our life better. You know, he was a part of the team and he wanted to be with us. He wasn't, he quit drinking, he quit, it was heroin he was on his whole life. So stop taking heroin, stop, you know, and nobody's perfect. Maybe somebody no had a relapse or that, wow. but yeah. he, from that point on, our lives all changed. You know, you get into school. Uh, so you were, um, so throughout this situation, like, were you, what was, uh, what was going on with him? Was he, um, uh, w- was he using drugs at that point? When so he, he came, like I said, like was I, drinking or? Well, f- like from the, you know, from earlier on my, uh, like I said, my dad was gone and my mom got together with him when I was very young, seven, eight, nine, sure. something like that. And, you know, he was a young man at the time, I think 27, six, eight. Uh, but he was into alcohol and drugs and heroin and he was a hillbilly as as much as they came. So he sanded floors and that was it with his uncle, his even more hillbilly uncle. And they would come over and I remember them pulling guns out on each other and all this hillbilly shit when I was a kid. But you know, that's was life. We didn't think any, we didn't have any other life. We, that's what we knew, you know? Uh, so you know, he just, you know, there, we were in and out of, uh, you know, shit happens when in situations like that with families. Right. Uh, my mom, waitress, waitress over here, waitress over there. She worked everything she could, you know, take care of him. And that's a whole nother situation. You know, she's learned from that, too. You know, you got when you grow up in the family, you go to the start going to these meetings. Eventually, you, you learn my mom's like a codependent, mm, alcohol, right. anonymous and all this other stuff. And we go with her because she don't have a babysitter. So I'm hearing this <laughs> stuff at. You know, you're getting a lesson on <laughs> yeah. codependency, yeah. Right, so which is not bad. I mean, you're a kid, but it's you know. But anyways, uh, so we're in and out of these foster homes, like I said, Lydia home. So we're in and out of care with families, and things go by, and that's kind of what leads up to the final ten year old fight when I thought I was uh, a grown up and I had to, I was able to put a stop to the situation. But you know what? In, re- in looking back, it did put a stop to it. Well, yeah, I mean, I you, know, you think it, about right? it, looking back, being thrown out the window was the best thing that happened to your family at that point, right? I agree. I mean, <laughs> isn't that crazy? It is. <laughs> it is because you know what? He, he, I remember talking to him about it, and he, he says, he, what he remembers is he doesn't remember like windows and all this the, stuff, yeah. but he remembers everybody holding him back against me like he was some monster, and he didn't understand it. So he didn't see it from our perspective, like, oh, yeah, God, right. he's killing everybody. Right. He might. Right. So he, he, that, that got him sent away for six months, and he had time to dwell on that. And like, well, maybe I'm not such a good guy. Right. Right. So that did change him. You, know? you go from things get better, and I know you, know you talked about sand and floors and stuff like that. Is that what kind of got you into thinking about the trades? Absolutely, Wiz, because... Well, my like I said, my 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 dad was sanded floors, which is a, a form of carpentry or a branch of carpentry, but he was non-union. He struggled every day, like up until his passing. He struggled. You go, you work, you sand floors, you do this, and then it gets you know so many other people because it's not, you know, maybe it's not the most complicated of things to try to get involved in. So when it's like that, an industry like that, it gets flooded with com- competition. And as the older he got and we got, it was obviously more flooded. So it became harder and harder for him to provide. And like I said, when I signed up for the Carpenters Union, well, I signed up for all the trades, but the Carpenters Union called me back. You were telling a story that you walked across the street and you signed right. up for every single trade. Car- trade. Yeah, because I hadn't done well in high school, I'll be honest. I mean, uh, I went to Lane Tech, which is a great school. My daughter goes there. It's mm-hmm. a great school. But I didn't really succeed in that school. I, I would say I barely passed, you know. So I maybe <laughs> I had the feeling maybe college is not for me. So me and a friend said, okay, well, let's, you know, let's be a trade. Let's do bricklayer or something. So we signed up for all of them. The first one to call me back was uh, the Carpenters Union, and that was in 1998. And I started, uh, started with them. And that's first you start off at a nine-week pre-apprenticeship. And I did that. They teach you the basics, you know. So they sent you a letter and said you've been accepted into for an apprenticeship. Yeah. Okay. Right. That that has to be pretty exciting. It was. I mean, you know, I didn't. It's even like looking back, it was like, oh, cool. I I got into school. It's no big deal. But looking back now, it's a a much more monumentous thing to try to to get 
some security back at that. You don't yeah. look at it like that when you're a kid. You just like, oh, this is a job. Yeah, uh, you, you got a happen. job that that pays you, you know, potentially real money, right? And a way to provide for you and your family at that but point. But now I think like like that <laughs> back when you're seventeen, eighteen, you're like. Oh yeah, this is a job. Okay, right. this, is, but, this is something that'll get me there. Yeah, yeah right. So I start. And, and you know. It's weird because, like, back, you know, and I, I won't say that I grew up in a in a broken home or a or super poor home or anything like that. But like, it's really weird getting into high school in a situation like where you're at. Because like, I mean, I know me. I I didn't do super well in high school either, and um, uh, I had kind of some family stuff going on. And it's it's weird going into high school with with baggage like that. Cause like, you know, no matter, and I've talked to you, Joe, like you, you're, you know, you're a smart guy. Like, you know, at that point in your life, or at least that's how I felt like no matter how well I did in high school, I ain't going to Harvard. You right, know, like yeah. I'm not, no one's paying for me to go to a university down in Kentucky. You know, like mm-hmm. I know that this is like, I could be successful inside of this neighborhood, but like, you're still stuck in this neighborhood, you know, and, and it's kind of, I don't know. Absolutely. So I was the first one in any of my family's knowledge to graduate high school. Yeah. You know, I mean, and then people did stuff. My my grandfather had a restaurant. He did that. My uncle was had a restaurant. He was in business. My uncle Steve was a police officer. My stepdad had his own business. So there wasn't something like... Hey, and I don't think any of those guys, right. guys went to high school. So it wasn't like high school. It was like, oh, you know, Joe, you need to go to high school. They're like, you know what? They were more on the other side. They're like, right. they you were, should start working. Right. <laughs> yeah. This well, is what we did. Well, that was the culture, yeah. you know, especially in that neighborhood where people didn't go to school. You went to work. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that's what I did. My, like I said, my dad would take me out. of. He's like, I said, I got a big test today and I'm not doing well. He's like, you're, you're probably not going to pass. Just come to work. <laughs> and then I would. I'm like, hey, you're probably right. So <laughs> we go to work. So, uh, so and, and, and going into this point, like in high school, are you, um, are you getting, I know you said it was your uncle Steve that was a police officer. Yeah. How, what's your relationship with him up to this point? Today? Up to today? No, know? up to like going into high school uh, and, um, and um, going into the trades and stuff. He, my uncle Steve is the same relationship today as he was when I was a child. He's just like a quiet steady dude that does what he has to do doesn't like sweat anything the sm- he's got his family mm-hmm. he he always looked out for us but he played an important role in your just, life right? just by him being himself he did yeah. yeah it's not like he's like joe i'm gonna take you and show you the ropes he just right. was himself and it was a good example to what I wanted to be like. I was to say he's kind of a statue in the family. Yeah. You know, well, like for me, I don't yeah. know. You know. So that's for you sure. you're you go through you finish your apprenticeship and at that point did you start working as a union carpenter? Oh, from the first day I started with this company called Denk and Roach. And okay. for the tradespeople or anybody that's listening, they know back in the '90s, Denk and Roach reputation was like a bunch of Vikings building <laughs> houses. Yeah. There were just it was just, but they were a. There were a great bunch of guys, a bunch of young guys, and they would show you. They wouldn't, you know, if you wanted to work and you were a hustler, which I've always been, I still try to be, they would show you, no, this is how you do it. This is how you do it. This is what you got to do. And they would give you these different opportunities. And they gave me so many opportunities, like as far as, you know, whatever you can think of as far as carpentry trim, windows, doors, rough framing, roofs. So you they, you applied to this company? No, the at the time the Carpenters Union, uh, I was a mem- I'm still a member of Carpenters Local 58. They kind of link you with this company. Oh, they're okay. like so they like, there's different types. There's residential carpenters, and then there's commercial concrete. They linked me with Dink and Roach, which is, was just building houses, residential carpentry, uh, and that's some of the most you know some of the best times of my life. You don't you know at the time I think I was 18 I. 18, 19, whatever it was, you have now, you have all the benefits of that the Carpenters Union offers. You have a great insurance plan. You get, I, in 1998, say I was a first year, I think it was 10 bucks an hour. Second year was maybe 15 bucks an hour. But back then, that's three times minimum wage or oh, something yeah. like that. Yeah. So, and you're only there for maybe, you've only been a member for like a year, you know? So, and that adds up. And I think if you're 18, making three times minimum wage, all your friends are like, what is this? So I try to get the friends, but none of, nobody lasted. But uh, 
So, so you, you keep so you end up uh, uh, going into it. Like, what did what did your career look like in the union? So you got the phone call, right? Mm-hmm. Do you go to school right away, or did they link you up with a company? Or no. That go? So the first nine weeks is like a pre apprenticeship program. Okay. So you go and you learn the bare minimum basics. Like, okay, well, this is a tape measure, and this is what a tape measure does. They make sure you know the basics of math, the layout, just the, so you got an idea of what you're getting into when you go to a job site. Oh yeah. And they, How you long know, did that last? It's nine weeks. That, okay. And it's free. The, the program's free. They actually give you a little stipend so that you're, you can make sure you get there. I mean, you, know, you don't need anything. I had moved out by the time I was 17 with another guy that got into the apprenticeship program. With me. Oh, wow. Nice. Uh, so two of us were living in like an apartment is you know, not much you know, bigger than 200 bigger than square feet. Bigger than the shitty feet. studio. Yeah. No, I didn't want that. <laughs> this, is, this is cool, man. This is exactly what you need for a studio. Oh, yeah, exactly. But it's like the size of an apartment. Two guys, we were oh, 17, yeah. 18, went to high school together. We went to the apprenticeship together. Nice. Uh, best friends now at this time. Uh, no kidding. Just both doing residential carpentry at the yeah. time. So we would go show up, talk to each other about work, talk to them about, yo, hey, what would you guys, oh, we're doing this. Oh, how did you do that? Oh, man, and it was great. It was awesome. Um, not so, to not to like link this to the firefighting thing, but like how'd you how'd you feel going into school and like actually doing something that was you know what you weren't reading a book and giving a dissertation on you know Charlotte's Web or whatever like you were you were going to school with like a you know I don't want to say a purpose because all schools purpose but like you were going into a school where you were you were obviously going to be working more with your hands did you feel like you were more at home absolutely with doing like that? absolutely yeah. I remember like I said I didn't do well in high school I don't think it was because I'm a dumb kid or oh, yeah. that just just didn't appeal to me I'm like well yeah. read this whole book it's hard about- to apply you know stuff yeah. like that to what you're going on in a situation right but when you see all these guys doing all this crazy stuff building something in front of you and you're like you get into it like wow i could do that so you know it, it helped it appealed to me a little more oh yeah you know so like you know the apprenticeship first second third fourth year apprenticeship and then you know i'm still working with the same company like i said dick and roach great company uh and they're teaching me they're doing this stuff you know like and there's a couple guys that are a little bit older than me Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a, my first foreman. His name is Sean Fitzgerald. Great guy. And then his brother came on a job, Steve Fitzgerald. Still a great guy. And these guys are like, tw- I'm 18. He's w- whatever, 23, 24. Both of them, the foreman, you know, he's 24, 25, 23. And these are guys like, oh, my God, these guys are now my heroes. And they're <laughs> fucking just, we're just having a great time. And, you you know, as a kid, seeing that this is where you can go, it's a it's a completely different experience than I had three, four, five years earlier, you know? So you start to get a little bit of ho- more hold, like, well, I can do anything, yeah. you know? So, you and know, I kept... And you're probably finding these stable figures in, in that company, too, where you're like, oh, my God, mm. this guy's got a family. Like, I can, right. I can do something with this, right? Not, yeah. Abs- well, you he- I mean, at 17, 18, you don't even think about a family. You don't right. think about insurance. You don't think about this stuff. But then you see a guy that the guys you look up to look up to. Mm-hmm. And he's an older guy. And, you're, and then he knows all this other shit. The guy's name, one, his name's Dan Brennan. I don't even know. I haven't heard about him in 20 years. But he always smelled like a backwood cigar, <laughs> I remember. So you didn't even have to know Dan Brennan was coming. Like, you didn't have to, like, see him. You could know. You smelled him. Like. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, shit, I better get to work. <laughs> so uh, that was awesome. That was all awesome. And he was a, such a great carpenter. He taught those guys. He taught, you know, me stuff like that. And then, well, like, now I'm probably the age Dan Brennan was. Now I see. I was like, damn. <laughs> what the hell is going oh, shit, on? that old motherfucker. I'm, yeah, I'm his right, age now. Right. <laughs> so we're going to, we're definitely coming back to your union carpentry stuff but at what point do you decide to go into the military i had just become a journeyman carpenter uh i was working with another journeyman we were both i think 22 21 22 building houses two of us building a whole like you guys build this whole house from the concrete we didn't do the concrete but it was poured already all the carpentry the wood carpentry so we're, we're now on the second floor happens to be the date of september 11th you know, 2001. We've got his sweet DeWalt radio on the deck, me and this kid, no shirt, shorts. It seems like a common theme that we have going on here at Chicago's Bravest Stories is that this is how it's that day this is, what is changed, synonymous you know? with a couple guests here so far. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. We'll, <laughs> we'll get you, you tell the story, we'll refresh your cocktail. Oh, yeah. All right. So, 
September 11th. We start at 7. Our jo- The hours were 7 to 3.30. Uh, and me and this kid, you know, two fucking kids. Bullshitting, working, having a good time all day long. Uh, and then whatever time it was, 8, 8.30 in the morning, the world changes forever. You know, not just for us, for everybody. The whole job site shut down. Nobody knew what to do. We didn't know if we should go home. We didn't know if we should... We didn't, nobody, like in any American at the time, didn't know what right. they should do. We were like, well, yeah. now what do we do? So we were on the job, hanging out all day. Superintendent comes out. The superintendent at, the, at that time was uh, Don Gusky. And the foreman, I can't even remember. but uh, And they're talking. And, they're, and we're asking them, what do we do? And you know, right, right. They're, they're like, oh, they're always, you know, we just keep working. We don't know yet. Right. So, so that happened, and then I said, you know, no. I, my uncle, on my dad's side, who was never around, we still had association with the family, but two of my uncles were in Vietnam. One was really injured in Vietnam. My great uncle on my mom's side, and all, all of them were, you know, Korean War, World War II guys, and I always looked up to them. I was going to say, so you're coming from this military. Family. Well, I'm coming from, yeah. I mean, in any way that those guys being in the military – you know, not my whole family. Like, my generation wasn't only myself and my cousin, Travis. His name's Travis Joseph. We both had, were from a similar stock, and we had that same feeling. He was a Marine, and I joined the Army. Uh, what made you decide the Army out of every, any other branch of the military? Because that's what my dad's brothers were in. Oh, okay. uh, and then my Uncle Steve's brother, George, George Schimmel, who I also looked up to. Uh, you know, we went up to Wisconsin, and they lived up there, too. He's like the warden of a prison or something like that. And I looked up to him. He's a cool, badass guy. He was an <laughs> engineer in the, in the Army, I remember. Uh, so that always stuck with me. And they're just people that I looked up to. So George, you know, he was an engineer in the Army. I was like, oh, that's sweet. I didn't even know what my great uncles were on my mom's side. But What did you want to do in the Army? What what's your Man, MLS I was, wound up being? My, I, I was already a German carpenter. 9-11 happened. I said... I went to the recruiter. I said, I tested well, you know, I could have done st- whatever. But then uh, I, they're like, well, what do you want to do? I said, well, I'm a carpenter. Can I do construction? So I joined the Army as an engineer, which has a lot of different meanings. But oh, yeah. It's like, a, you know, construction area stuff. So uh, that's what I did. I joined the reserves first joined and then you know we went to the weekends and this and stuff that and the wars raging on people you know getting killed my age getting killed and this and it just didn't sit well with me we're still here you know we went to build schools in south america okay that's nice. well, so, you're, so you go through basic training right mm-hmm. um yeah. where was that at fort leonard wood okay and then um, after basic training, you they ship you off pretty much right away. Just no, doing work no. Or, well, since I going? was a member of the carpenters union, mm-hmm. I didn't have to do the carpentry training. That was one of the benefits. Oh no, kidding! And okay. I started off at a little bit of a higher rank because they had the, the carpenters union has the accepted apprenticeship program. What they said, okay, well, you don't you don't have to do this part. So I didn't I have no to do idea. that part. Yeah, a lot of people don't know yeah. that, but which was fine. So I said, yeah, let's do that. And, I did that. And, and you got a bump in rank. I got a bump in rank, yeah. I mean, it's from, like, you when you join the Army, you're a E1 or whatever. So I got a bump in rank to E3. And then 18 months later, you or 12 months or whatever it is, you get another bump. So somebody who's an E1 in 12 months, they're an E2. In 12 months, I was an E4, which was awesome. Oh, yeah. And, you know, when you're seeing one year... When you're trying to boss people around, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I can did, boss did your three. Buddy, did your buddy end up joining too, or no? No, no, he didn't. Uh, yeah, no. Yeah, we. I by yeah, then I think I had right. moved out my own place. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm t- you know we just kind of not gone our separate ways, but we've oh, yeah. we're no, both you, you know yeah, 22. I'm a grown on. man now. I need right. my own place. <laughs> right. So um, so you end up going through basic training then, and then what? Uh, reserves. For a couple of years. And like I said, it was getting, you know, the reserves were just building stuff here in South America, going over here to build projects. We're doing schools and humanitarian type stuff. And then in the back of my mind, my uncles were in Vietnam, World War II, Korea. I said, this is, I, I need to do something more. I mean, I, you know, I'm just being honest. I was like, no, I got to, I want to be part of this. 
So I joined the active duty. And you're saying in combat. Combat, much, yeah. Right? That's what I mean, that's when... That's what it's about. That was what it was about for me at yeah. that time. I was like, no, I mean, I like building schools and stuff like that. But sure. No, I want. I'm. This is the war. We want to. I want to yeah, go I, to the war. I, yeah, I did. You you didn't join the army to build schools, right? You joined the army at nine eleven because you you know you want to you want to to fight for our country, right? I wanted to fight. So, you know, I joined the active duty army. So my wife, you know, we just had an eight nine month old daughter, or you know. When I when we did, when I decided I was going, she was eight nine months old. Oh my god! I, but here I didn't know I was going to go to combat like the next day. Yeah. So <laughs> is that what happened? It, basically, <laughs> I, I signed up. I, I signed up to join the active army. We could go out. They were waiting for you. Well, I, like, <laughs> I, this is what I was thinking. We'll go out there. We'll kind of establish ourselves. Well, everything will get nice. Got, and got then their I itinerary. no They're right like, no. I was I, I, had, like, I hadn't even left Illinois. They're like okay. Your your whatever battalion command or I can't remember the ranks anymore. Sure, so like you're gonna be with this unit, the this engineer brigade first, first engineer brigade or whatever the hell it was. And then I said, okay, wait, I call over there. You can call. They give you how to call and contact. So we see so because you're gonna you gotta move now because now yeah. you're enlisted. So they're like, okay, yeah, you're in the eight sixty fourth engineer battalion. I say, oh, okay, we'll call this number. So I call the number. I call the guy. And I'm still a civilian, So, and these guys, you know, it's still different. They're, I said, hey, you know, I'm calling this today. This for, yes. And I said, well, you know, I just recently been signed up. I'm getting ready to move out there. What do you guys want me to do? Pack your shit. We're going to Afghanistan in about <laughs> two months as soon as you go. I was like, oh. All right, so I told my wife. So like underwear <laughs> and uh, socks, right? <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, I don't know, right? <laughs> Do you got any guns to bring with you? I don't <laughs> right, know. Right, no, right. But uh, bazookas, we'll, yeah, we'll take right, anything right. really at this point. <laughs> but that's basically how it was. So before I even was supposed to move out there, I knew as soon as I got there, there was going to be a little Things bit of a... Off. Right, a little bit of a period because they had left a little bit before I got there or whatever. So I was going to meet them out there. So your unit left... Be right. Priority. Okay. So you had to well, catch up with them. Right. Okay. So it, there was no kind of, there's not going to be any like home making or anything <laughs> right. like that. Right. So Make my wife, bed. Uh, right. My <laughs> wife decided to stay back here with her family, which was the best decision, you know. Uh, what was the other option? I mean, we could all move out there. She could get on post housing. She could be by herself. Oh, kidding. Yeah. But she, I mean, who would want right. to do that yeah, in this no. situation? So, you know, she stayed here with her parents. Support, you know, because we had a young daughter. Yeah. Uh, so I got out there. I stayed in Fort Lewis, Washington for maybe a month or so, whatever it was. And then uh, out to Afghanistan. So we get out there and I, you know, there's a little bit of transition when you're trying to get to your unit because you got to go here. They fly you to here. You got to stay. You got to catch another flight. And then you're, but you're, you know, you're by yourself. It's not like there's somebody directing you on what to go. Right. All you know is you got to get to the 864th. Engineer Battalion. And then along, it's funny, like along the lines, there's other guys that also got to go that have been in the Army for a long time. And so I get, and they say, okay, you got to go over to this place and try to find a flight. So I go, the same day I get there, I go try to find a flight, you know? And the guy's like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> you just got here. Wait a little bit before somebody calls for you. Have a drink, man. <laughs> Relax. Kick your feet off. <laughs> right. They're like, you don't want to go over there right now. Well, on our last podcast, <laughs> we had guys who were saying that that part of it, getting to your unit, was kind of a rite of passage because there's no instruction manual and there's no protocol that you hop on this plane, you hop <laughs> right. on this bus, you hop on this car, yeah. you go there. They're like, yeah, they're like you show out, up, they drop you off at point A, you have to make it to point B. <laughs> right, that's a whole... Uh, by this time, good luck. Yeah. Get, get there. Right. And so these guys are just jumping on whatever rig they can find. Hey, where are you guys headed? All right, well, hop on, you know, and that was a rite of passage for these guys. So it sounds like you found yourself in the very same situation, right? Yeah, but like, I'm a, like for me, I'm a stickler for things to go, Structure. how they got to go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I would get there the same, like they get there the same day. I'm like, oh, where are you going? Oh, I'm going to 864 too. Okay, I'll find the plan for it. So I go and I find, I talk to the guy, you know, like you got to do, you got to get over here. You First you can't go right there. You got to go over here. So I'm finding out the passage and the dudes with me are like, and I maybe I'll rank them a little bit. And they're like, why are you like, what's, 
Maybe, What's the rush? Right. Chill <laughs> out. Listen, it's not going to be fun when we get there. Let's get these there. Guys are, <laughs> these guys are, are probably on their second tour. No, it was all our first tours for the most part, but there they had been there longer than I was, and they knew, like, okay, you go to R&R, you, you know, you get there, but, you know, you get back. <laughs> but there's, <laughs> and I was, like, regimented. No, we got to go now. Right. So I Plus, you left where you were to try and get in combat, so, like, you weren't, you know... You you didn't make that move to to chill, you know. <laughs> like you were right. Yeah, I don't know what it was, but that's just yeah. my personality. I would oh, say. Yeah. What was when you finally made it out there to your um, to unit. your unit? What what was your mission at that point? Well, let me speak just before I finally made it out there. Helicopter here, helicopter there, this, and then I remember I met up with a bunch of people that were going over there, and then uh, I said, "Hey, I'm going there too." Can I go with you guys? And they're like, yeah. And then I ta- was talking to a E6 sarge- staff sergeant. I was an E5. He's like, yeah, you jump in with us. You're going to drive for me, though. And I, my f- first time in Afghanistan, you know, didn't, never been on a convoy, never been. Any, I had no br- training on any <laughs> of the shit. He didn't know that, but <laughs> I just came from the reserves. You know, he, he assumed that I was a full-fledged sergeant. He's like, yeah, you're my driver, though. I said, okay, I'm your driver. So we're driving, driving. I have no idea where I am. Uh, no idea anything, like what to do if something goes wrong or any. But he doesn't know that, and I'm not saying anything. <laughs> and then, like, over there, the dust kicks up in, like, in front of you. Like, it's like moon dust, they call it. It's like, it's like powder all over the place. And I was like, and they're driving, like, you know, 25, 30 miles an hour. I'm like, what the f-? I And I'd never done anything. You don't like see this. brake lights. No, there's <laughs> nothing. Just sand. I was like, I don't know if they're going 60 or 30 or 20, so I would just try to drive until I could see a little bit of a car or something like that. And he's falling asleep. I was like, God, this guy's falling asleep. It's, <laughs> I don't know what to do if, if we all... The only guy who knows what to do is <laughs> yeah, falling right. asleep. <laughs> and, you know, you got to take a piss. I got to take a piss like a... F- like nobody's business. There's no convoy stopping. I'm like, hey, yo, I got to take a piss. He's like, so what? You got to piss. I'm like, well, I'm not going to yeah. piss my pants. What do I do? He's like, there's bottles all over the place. Piss in a bottle while you're driving. It's like new guys, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, so uh-huh. you, you, find, you figure out quickly <laughs> oh, yeah. what to do because you can't stop a 20-car convoy in the middle of a mountain. Hey, right. Joe's got to piss. Yeah. Let's see what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So we get to the unit. Guy backs out. I almost run him over on accident with the commander and the first sergeant watching on the new sergeant. So I, am, I actually almost run him over. He's like, what the fuck are you doing? Nobody know. They, they're like assuming I'm this professional dude. Like, <laughs> I just fucking showed up. It, I'm the new guy, you know, and they don't even know. They're you like, haven't even been there 24 hours. I haven't even never been in the active <laughs> army, never been in the active army, came straight from reserves, fucking dumbass. But they assume you're sorry. You know what the fuck? He been there. Yeah. Like I don't want to be like. No, tell me what to do. I don't know. You know. And what what year is this for comedy? Uh, Two thousand five. I would. Okay. Two thousand five. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, so things are shitty, for sure over there. Yeah, I mean, I guess so. So, but whatever. I get established. They bring me in, commander, company commander, uh, first sergeant. They're like, okay, sergeant, tell us. <laughs> and like, I don't know what to say. I'm like, uh, I'm not a very good soldier, but I can, I'm a, I'm good at construction. I don't. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so that's where they kind of lead me and, uh, you know, to the construction stuff. And, you know, so I yeah, eventually learn how to be a good soldier. It takes a little bit of time, but. <laughs> yeah. So is this the Army Corps of Engineers? Yeah. Well, okay. no, that, I think that's a civilian thing. Is it? I don't know if it's. Is it? Okay. Yeah. It's just the engineers. I'm not like a. You know, like at that time, I'm just, do, it's like a CB, they call it. You yeah. know, you just, yeah, that's right. you don't want to, you don't want to. Well, that's the only thing everybody knows about. You know, <laughs> right. you know what I mean? So I know engineers stuff, but there's a different co- branches, not branches, but like sections of engineers, you know. And so you, you, you get there, you get to your unit, you find, you, you don't run over your <laughs> company commander and yeah. your first sergeant. You hit the ground running, they start having you build stuff. Um, like what, what, what kind of stuff are you doing? Um, when you start working out there, like I said, I was a uh, wood tank and roach for such a long time. I was a good carpenter for. I was an average carpenter for Chicago, 
but I was a really good carpenter for the army. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So there was, uh, you know, buildings, you're building walls. I was like, ah, no problem. Build walls, build this. Uh, uh, but the only thing I hadn't done, which was new, they're like, hey, we want you to make these trusses. So I had to figure out how to make trusses, which was cool. I'd never done that in Chicago. They just come out, you know. Right. right. So they're I, already pre-made. Yeah, they're pre-made. Yeah. But now I'm setting up. But I learned from Dank and Roach used to have these things called panel shops. They would make it on site. They'd have a layout. You'd build the walls in one area. Like they'd have different like layouts. So you do you build this wall. You build it. You build it. You build all the walls in one area, and then they like had a tip car. Up. Right. They had a, a truck, petty bone. They would bring it out to the different houses or the townhomes, and then they would build it. So I set that up in the Army. I was like, oh, let's build all the trusses right here on a nice flat surface. Mm -hmm. We'll build them all, and we'll send them out. And then they had cranes and all this other shit. That, uh, so I did that. I, I brought that little bit of Chicago, Dank and Roach, Chicago construction to Afghanistan. And then, like, no one, like we just figured out our little system. Sure. So they would. What well, worked for you over there. Yeah. We got pretty good at it and they would have us so like oh these guys are decent this this company this platoon but keep building build 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 well our other guys would be out like looking for landmines or whatever you know whatever <laughs> they were doing or you know checking shit for bombs we got good at building and so <laughs> we would yeah, build yeah, well i know yeah. there's a sub story that goes along with the union because i know the carpenters union took care of you while you were overseas right Ooh. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I was in active duty for a to like maybe over three years, close to four years or whatever it was. Uh, and I came back. Open arms welcomed by the Chicago Regional Council of Carpenters. And not only did they open it up and try to find me. It was 2008, 9, 10 or whatever it was. It was I think it was 9. But the economy was collapsed. But they found stuff for me. They're like, Joe, okay, you just got back here. Not only did they do so that, so the union's actively working on your behalf to find yeah, you work. Right, that's awesome. Because my, you know they know I'm back and things are bad with the with the construction. But and when you left, things were good, right? It was great. They were great. Yeah, yeah. But not only did they do that, all the time I was in active army during the wartime, they gave me pension credits as a you know, wow. right? The pension credits they they. Kept up with the insurance now, is requirements. That the, the carpenters union itself, or was that your local? That's something that the the like carpenters give those, union give the those Chicago. guys the credit that they deserve for right, taking care of you. So the Chicago Regional them. Council of Carpenters uh, took care of my family for while I was in the army, and then a long time after I got back to make sure I got on my feet. Uh, I, I will never be able to be grateful enough to for what they did for me and my family while I was serving overseas. Uh, you never asked for help or anything? They just took care of you right when you got back? Absolutely. I didn't even know they would do that stuff. Uh, it came back. You know, it was a, it was a 2009, if everybody knows. it was Everybody knows the economy collapsed. So they... The, the housing market. Housing market yeah. especially, more than anything else. And that's what was my specialty. So they made sure that my family had insurance for like nearly a year after I got back. My so family they had, kept up your health insurance and everything like that. Right. They, and then also while I was overseas, they gave me pension credits, like a point a year or something, like which each equals now to the pension now is like for every one point, you get $100 added to your pension per year. And by all rights... They had the right to just put you on hold yeah, while you absolutely were they did. while you're on. So they didn't have to do all that extra stuff. They could have like, okay, well, you're on hold. We're not going to penalize you. We're not going to right. But they went way above and beyond. But not just you know? putting you on hold, but to give you credits is an amazing thing that right. your your union did for you. And it, yeah, the union did it. But the fact that all the brothers and sisters of the carpenters union had allowed that to happen is an amazing thing. They all, they're all they just patriots, too, you know, like yeah. just like most Americans. They want people who have served, they want them to not fail. So that's just a reflection of how the Carpenters Union is. That That's that's pretty amazing that those guys took care of you and your family while you were serving your country. Yeah, and I am going to be forever grateful for that, for sure. And that's, again, that's local. 
What do you mean local? It's not the We're local. Not, well, it's not your um, local. It's no, the whole entire it's the region. Yeah. It's, uh, well, the Chicago Regional Council of Carpenters. They have that policy. You know, now our, you know, the president of the Carpenters Union or the executive secretary tre- treasurer is Gary Perriner, and he's continuing those policies. And then they they're making it even better for people that serve and uh, the members. So during this pandemic, they're doing so many so many different things. They're making you know my. I, I'm not a working carpenter anymore, but I'm still a member. Uh, I have, my friends are working carpenters. So, yeah. they, you know, they have, if you're not working, they've extended the insurance benefits for members who have had, you know, met that all that criteria, which is basically you're an active carpenter. Right. So they still have insurance a year later, even though the hours aren't there. Because basically if you're, everything's going smooth and you're a carpenter, you got to work a certain number of hours, you get your... It's not a lot, but whatever it is, you you get your insurance and stuff based on that. And then everyone sees due to COVID and stuff like that, there are pe- a lot of people not able to do that stuff. The trade shows are affected. Commercials affect. Everybody's affected. So they're extending those benefits to people. And they're making everybody's lives easier. Like they ha- Even if you don't qualify, they have a low-cost option. It's I don't even want to say how low it is because I don't know if they... Right. But it's so yeah. low that you can but still get... But they're really making it affordable so that even if you can't so get those hours in, that you can... If you can't get those hours and you didn't qualify before, you know, God forbid there's an emergency situation with your family, you're not going to go bankrupt. You know, you can take care of your family, which is amazing, you know? That is a beautiful example of how it's an argument for people who are non-union... You tell them your story, and that might be a game changer for somebody who's like, I, I don't understand unions. I don't believe in unions. But here's a union looking out, like going way above and beyond to take care of you and your family and other people in time of need. Like the union had their backs. That's what it is. They do. They're, they're having their backs, and they're doing everything they can to, to get through this pandemic and keep everybody on a stable footing, you know what I mean? And, uh, and you know, there's so many other, other examples for sure. In in our timeline with you, Joe, you... Overseas. You, you, you're still overseas, and then you came back? Okay, so the first tour was, I was like I said, it's a little less than a year. I, uh, I was in Afghanistan. We went to, you know, so as engineers, you move around, you go to different bases, you build up stuff, you go in the middle of nowhere, you start setting up a base for whoever else. We do that for a year. I mean, you know, there's little bombings and mortars. And you guys are, like, building fobs and stuff like that. Yeah, all over. right, right. We're, so we're not in, like, a central base of a big place. They send us out to, to build up forward operating bases pretty much. So, I mean, like I said, I'm not uh, some kind of combat ninja, but we would go out there and, you know, people would – not like us there so they shoot bomb this that and uh you know we dealt with it we're, i was a kid now knowing back then i was just a kid too so we'd do what our, our bosses say and you know we got through that deployment the first year we come back we get our first uh you get a, a leave everybody gets a little bit of break on my break i try to join the special forces so everyone's got their 30 days uh vacation because they just got back i go to special forces selection and assessment it's a three four week course or whatever it's a where they just beat you up for a month and uh, see what the fuck you're made out of if they want you around or whatever uh so we go through that and it's a pain in the ass you're at fort bragg at this point right fort bragg and they're beating the shit out of you every day rolling you in sand trying to figure out if you're if you can handle whatever whatever they got to throw at you. Uh, so I go through that for a month, and I get, I, I think we started out with four or 500 guys. By the end, there was, I think, one or maybe like 200 guys left that just didn't quit. And out of that 200, I think they selected 70, 80 guys. And I was one of those guys. And that, you know, I was never a Green Beret, but that was one of the most proudest moments of my life because I was like, shit. You made it through. Slug. I made it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't finish the whole thing, and I know it's it's not a. It was never that, but like I said, 
even that was a that's problem. A, that's a pretty good accomplishment, Joel. I wouldn't, I wouldn't downplay that. No, I'm downplaying it because there are a lot of Green Berets and Special Forces operators that have been through 90 or 100 times more than that. You know what I mean? But I just want to say that's a special moment in my life. That's all I'm saying. Uh, so we made it through that. We go back to uh, Fort Lewis. All the, my friends that have been at home for a month, they came back a little fatter. <laughs> I came back 20 pounds lighter. And right. they're like, are you Joe? You've been getting your, been getting your just, ass kicked for a month. Yeah. Right. No food, no sleep, no nothing like that. But they're like, what happened? So I got selected, and I ended up, you know, getting teamed up with the, not teamed up, but like assigned to a unit, a special forces group out in Fort Lewis, just till I would be, to start the training for special forces. So was, I was not, I would Green Beret, but they're like, okay, you go with these guys, and what would they do? It was like, just make fun of us, <laughs> throw stuff at us, make us be the test dummies, all that good dumb shit. You know sure. what I mean? That sure. you should have to do if you're going. Sounds through. like a regular hazing <laughs> anywhere you go. Right. So, so and then I said, told my wife, I was like, hey, you know, my daughter at this time, I'd barely even seen her, maybe a couple times, a few times since nine months, you know. And uh, I said, hey, you know, I got. Selected the special forces. I'm gonna be able to go. We're gonna move to North Carolina. We're gonna be. I'm gonna be an American hero at some point. And <laughs> this, and she's like, "Oh, that's good, Joe. You go, and then we're gonna get a divorce." <laughs> I said, "Wait, are you serious?" She's like, "Yeah, I'm not doing this anymore, Joe. You know, Megan is. She's getting bigger now. She doesn't even know. She calls you Daddy Joe. She doesn't even know really who you are. But I can't do this anymore. So I had to make a decision, and I made a." the right decision. I said, okay, fine, I'm going to get out of the Army. <laughs> so I got out of the Army and uh, came back here, and that's when the Carpenters Union took care of me and all that stuff. But, uh, you know, they, they could only do so much for so long, and the economy was bad for so long. Uh, and then, you know, I was trying Again, to find a way out. 08, 09, you're 08, saying? No, it was getting around. They took care of me 08, 09, 10. But there's only, like now, it's starting to get even bad for everybody. Right. Yeah. E- even the unions are... Right, running law and funds, and I didn't. I felt bad to keep asking so much when they did so much already. Right, and then like so, I started going to using the GI Bill to go to college. I was like, well, okay, this will buy some time. Did you did you complete your contract with the army? Was, were, did you sign read, up for your for your contract? Well, like so, when you send a contract, it's eight years total. So I did it a few years in the reserves. I did like uh, almost four years. Your reserve eight. time counted. Yeah, okay. it's all that. It's got to be a combination of reserve active IRR or whatever. I mean, there was a guy I was in the Army with. He served, the contract's eight years, but he served like 15 months active and then like six years in IRR or something right. like that But because they needed people. Right. But uh, so mine was, I did a few years in the reserves, a few years in the active, and then a couple years or a year and a half or so in IRR. And that's how that went. But, uh, you know, like the jo- jobs were getting tough. So I said, oh, okay, I'm going to go to school. Use the GI Bill, go to school, that's what you do, and you succeed. So I went. I went to DePaul, and they had this great program. It was a yellow ribbon program that would, uh, they would, like, because there's only certain benefits the GI Bill does. Like, our government, our taxpayers only pay for a certain amount of college. But the schools that have a yellow pr- yellow ribbon program, DePaul being one of them, said, okay, you know, weren't the government issue stuff doesn't cover the whole cost of tuition and books and this and that. So we'll cover the rest. So I was able to go to DePaul. I got a degree. So, I mean, Joe, for somebody who didn't do well in high school, you're going to a pretty prestigious college now on the GI Bill. Like what? Plus you, 10 how, years after I had got not done so well in high school. Right. You know what I mean? So you saying that you weren't that smart, you didn't do well in high school, now, after you come back from active duty, you're going to a pretty, pretty good college now. Yeah, you're doing all right. So, I, th- I, what made you decide that DePaul was where you wanted to go? Just because of the benefits that that you could get through the GI Bill, like they were able to pick up some of the the, the slack for you. No, I mean, no, not necessarily. It was close to because you, you know, could. I could have gone to. Uh, a f- I could have. I mean, not that they would have accepted me or whatever based on whatever, but the, the, the other colleges that had yellow ribbon, like University of Chicago, uh, Loyola, 
DePaul. I picked DePaul. I mean, I've always been kind of a religious person, and the Catholic part of that. The and I've been a religious person, but not really knowing much about it. Right. So the Catholic part of that that they had added to it kind of appealed to me. So I wanted to learn a little bit about the Catholic religion, and I thought not as like from church, but through like his, you know, right. that was part of it. Yeah, so like that's the kind theology of theology over your yeah. yeah. So to learn the history of the because that's part of the curriculum. It is, is, is yeah. theology there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that appealed to me, and I wanted to know. Like I said, I'm always been a spiritual, religious guy, but I wanted to explore that a little bit more. And that, and DePaul offered all that, and then they, I didn't have to pay much. Uh, out of pocket. So that's why I chose to go to DePaul, which, you know, I don't regret for one second, for sure. This episode of Chicago's Bravest Stories is brought to you by the Firefighting Depot. The Firefighting Depot is a firefighter and family owned company. Their aim is to offer the very best of the service. They're passionate about their product listings and work continuously and very hard to improve upon them every chance they get. Their motto is that firefighters deserve the best, and they are on a mission to provide it. Visit the website. That's thefirefightingdepot.com. Um, if you go on the website, you'll be able to find a automated service. I'll give you a 10% off code, and I know they're pushing a, a whole list of products. What do they got over there, Vince? They got those Honeywell boots. Those are real nice. Uh, the Viridian fire gloves. I'll tell you, those Viridian firefighting gloves... I've, they've got some great names. Uh, <laughs> the, here here uh, we go. One of them, we got the Fire Hog, which <laughs> that's, uh, you're, you're going to want to look out for that one, um, especially at the bar late at night. <laughs> there's there's also, um, actually, their most state-of-the-art glove that they have is the Fire Knight, um, which, again, very, uh, really interesting product that I'd love to see more of. They've also got, uh, how about for ro- hose straps? They have the Fire by Trade, the hose straps for high rise packs. Yeah, that's they have a big reflective tape there, right? and then the Velcro. You, you put it all together, and I think they it, up to two and a half. Yep, yep, up to two and a half inch hose. Um, it'll work great on your high rise packs. Um, so, again, make sure to visit the firefightingdepot.com. You can visit them on Facebook. They're super responsive on there, um, so feel free to, to reach out to them there. And again, make sure to take a look at that 10% code when, you, when you're when you checking out their website. Yeah. Firefighter and family-owned, Illinois-based. They ha- they literally have everything for the fire service in their uh, catalog. So anything you need from tools to apparel, you can get it at uh, firefightingdepot.com. You get to the Paul... Where, where does CPD come into play here? It comes after DePaul. Okay. Well, I took the test be- before DePaul. When you applied for CPD, that was the time where an associate's was uh, part of... It was right. It, it was, was a mandatory Associates, associates or, uh, or four years in the Army. And I had both. Okay. So... I didn't know it was either or. Yeah. Okay. And it was both. Well, I don't know if it was at the time I took the test or by the time I got hired, but... By the time it got hired, that was a policy. And they, they've, within the last couple of years, changed that, that policy, right? And eh, I don't need, I mean, I don't look <laughs> up at that policy. I don't know. I don't need that part anymore. What's, so. what's your mindset going in uh, DePaul with this show? Are you, are you thinking that CPD's the end game, or you're still, like, just trying to stave off? No, at that time, I was thinking, thinking, I mean, you go through all the stuff, even the construction, the Army, the combat deployments, the... Uh, Everything. And, and to be fair, you've lived the entire fucking life by the time you're, how old are you at this point? Like 27 20, yeah. or something like that. Yeah, so like you've, so I mean, my body you're, was you're taking not a some beating. punk at 19 years old. Yeah, like my, my body had taken a beating, and I knew that I wouldn't be able to frame houses forever. So I was like, shit, I need to figure out where my next step is. Yeah. So I was thinking like construction management. I could go work with Don Gusky and maybe estimate job. <laughs> oh, so you were kind of thinking you were. Thinking I was like trying to think business management of, of construction, construction because that's okay. my thing. Cool. I was trying to do stuff like that. I was thinking that. that so I went. I got a degree in accounting. Uh, I had minors in math. For whatever reason, math is my favorite. I suck at it, but I enjoy it. Like puzzle. It's like a yeah. puzzle. So yeah. I like. I like that aspect of it. But so I. I still do shit like that. But uh, so I enjoyed that. So I took math, accounting. So I ended up. You know, they make you choose at some point. The the army, the GI Bill, the boss, like, okay, dude, 
what the fuck are you going to do? <laughs> right. You got to figure it out. Get, to, get some going here. <laughs> yeah, so I got accounting, uh, management, and uh, economics, which was also pretty cool. Degree, uh, degree and minors or whatever. So I, I started working at, you know, while I was there, an accounting company. Accounting, no, a U.S. Gypsum it was for a little bit uh, in their accounting department or whatever. Most uh-huh. fucking boring job <laughs> I ever had in my life. Yeah. I was wow, like, the, what the, the, ca- the The crazy world of accounting, Joe? You don't think that was? <laughs> yeah. Well, like, listen, I've been, you know, street guy, uh, outside guy, uh, combat outside, all this <laughs> stuff my whole life. I was like, I, I need something quieter, calmer. <laughs> and then I try to do something. I was like, this is ridiculously <laughs> quiet and calm. Uh, this is not me. Kind of hard on this, yeah. Right, this is not me. So, so a being they an knew it. They like, at the same time, to though, to join CPD, right? That, those, those guys at U- U.S. Chips on too. They're like, "This is they, for you. This is, this is <laughs> not Did you, they man. Say that? This, no, but they made it clear. They alluded that, to it. Yeah, <laughs> this is not for you, man. This were is. Were you not, an actual accountant? Or you I were doing wor- accounting? No, I them? mean, while you're in college, you got to sure. go work at a company. Yeah, okay. so you do accounting shit and. Yeah. You're not like a. He's not a CPA. No, I'm not a CPA or nothing like that. But I could. Look at Joe. <laughs> right. Joe is no CPA. <laughs> <laughs> but like I said, been, yeah. I, I, I wanted to get away because I've been, you know, I mean, along right. with all that other stuff, you've got to think about the trauma of combat, the trauma of childhood, the trauma of all this shit, and just wanting to escape it. So I was like, oh, let's go do something safe. Right. Like and a you got, Yeah, and you got one kid at this point? Yeah. Yeah, so like you're, I mean, I... I would imagine that you're thinking longevity. Like right. What's What's going to get me to see her? What's going to get my know? daughter to call me by dad instead right. of Daddy Joe, right. yeah. Papa Joe, or <laughs> like, <laughs> oof. Mm. Well, what What Like, what was the the tipping point that said, "All right, I'm going to put my name on the CPD list"? Well, like I said, back to my uncle Steve. I mean, anytime there was a test, he would call me up. Joe, go take the test. Go take the test. I was like, well, the first. I, for a long time, I couldn't take them because I didn't have two years of college. I didn't have military. And then finally he calls me, Joe, there's a test. Go take it. And I had both. I was what, like, year, yeah. what year was this, Joe? I think it was uh, 2010, maybe. Okay. And then so I had to take the test. Nine, eight, ten, something around when I first got back. So I take the tests, and I'm on a list. And then now I got, you know, combat. I got college, this, all that stuff. And then uh, CPD have preference for that as well? They have the veterans preference, yeah. Okay. The, you know, thankfully the, the the city has veteran preference for, you know, this and that. And then they also have, because I'll be honest, some of the issues that I faced in combat and whatever else, yeah, I'm still to this day getting treatment like PTSD. You get nightmares of things that you've seen. I I should say I get nightmares of things that I've seen or done or whatever else. And then, uh, you know, it haunts you for weeks at a time sometimes or months at a time sometimes. So you take, you you know, you go through the VA, you get help and all that stuff. That is another story. It took me 10 years to try to find that help after I got out of the Army. But, you know, I've been dealing with that for a few years now. So took well, you a long time to, like, to, self-diagnose to realize that you actually had a problem, huh? Well, I mean, you always, I, me, I always knew there was an issue. But I didn't want to go to therapists or ask for pills or whatever the fuck else because I didn't want to limit my future. I felt like, okay, now I'm in with CPD. I don't want them to say, oh, you got PTSD. Why are you, you shouldn't be carrying a gun. We can't. So you got to think about your kids, your future, your family. So you keep it all bottled up, and you don't try to rock the boat too much. But the boat starts to rock anyways, and then at some point you got to deal with it. And the same—that's what happened to me. I I have to deal with these issues that I was I was certainly having. I mean, where where'd you get help at? I started out at uh, Jesse Brown uh, VA. You just went to the VA. I just went to the VA because I knew. I mean, I knew it was I wasn't going to be able to survive too long dealing with this stuff on my own. My poor wife had to deal with it for, you know, she's still around, but I was like, what do you do? What do you do? Where do you go? And uh, it just wasn't going well in my life. Construction, anything wasn't, it was just spiraling. And then 
you had a pro- you had a problem. Yeah, I and, mean, I couldn't deal with it on my own. That's right. all it was. And uh, just speaking Brown of problems, take care of you? not being able to deal oh, with yeah, it on I'm my sorry. own. I'm, I'm eyeballing it. I, I didn't want to get in the <laughs> middle of it. <laughs> Say it again. Jesse Brown took care of you. Well, Jesse Brown facilitates care. Okay. You got to be able to know what you need and be able to accept the help you need. So once you real like for me, it's a it's all a process. Like I think it was, I was still in uh, DePaul. I was still at DePaul. So it was me, twenty twenty nine. I remember I I remember the moment that I realized I needed help. I uh, was going to DePaul. You got to say, I mean, it's downtown, so you should, it's there's no parking. You take a bus yes. and a train and all that shit. So I missed the one bus. Fine. Okay, I'm a soldier still. I strapped my backpack on. It was a big backpack, like a combat type backpack. I had, and I'm wa- marching down the fucking Lincoln Avenue like a freaking psycho, <laughs> trying to like on a mission. You know what I mean? I gotta get this. And then like I see somebody come by, drive by me, two young kids, and they just drive by slow, and they're like, "Holy fuck!" I remember them looking at me like, "What are they looking at?" And then I realized I was a psycho. <laughs> so, so, so I was, it was I remember clear as day I was like that's the moment I realized there was something an issue <laughs> you know you know the what the ability to take a look at yourself as a third person be like this guy's a fucking maniac. <laughs> like, there's there's something to be said for that, but it's self reflection to know. Well, I, I don't think that Joe's the only person who's ever walked down Lincoln <laughs> I, Avenue. Dude, I did it this afternoon. <laughs> I, right. I mean, most of them don't know that they're said they don't. You know, they're not cognizant enough to see it. But but it was that yeah. guy's reaction to. I was hiking. I was like, hike, bro, go. I got to be there at fucking this time. I'm yeah. like, go, 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 bro. Oh man, the time. All right. Holy fuck. Right, right. And I'm like, your feet are bleeding. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Got like a banana peel hanging off right. your face. Like you don't even know. Like, you remember in the army, take, you know, <laughs> drink water right now. And I was like ridiculous. I, and then I realized like, my God, Joe, something might be wrong. <laughs> well, that's, that's something that um, I, I know we've said this before, but like, that's something that we like, uh, we, we just kind of stumbled on, on, on this whole thing is that like, it's it's amazing how like just our mindsets as as cops and firemen that like we just don't think about this or you think about like like emotion as a weakness and like you just don't think about it like we just again we just kind of stumbled into this whole like PTSD awareness thing where it's like dude like it's not like there's there's something up man and like if you don't if you're not able to see that in yourself at the right time, that's why suicide is such a problem among you know among our communities and in your community. Like yeah, it's it's sure. amazing that like you just I, don't. You know, well, CPD, there. I, I just on another podcast that we have here, um, one of the guys was saying that the CPD is like four times the national average for suicide. Yeah, so and something you know what? Ridiculous. I'll say this here, and I've never said it anywhere else. I've been. Considering I considered suicide in my past as a CPD dude, uh, a couple times I've been close. It's a pain in the ass, man. But you know, luckily I pulled out of it. Uh, not everybody's so lucky. Why I pulled out of it and they didn't, I don't know. Uh, I haven't it, dug too much into it. So. so when you were in your dark times, how deep in your career were you when you got to that point? I think that, so, you know, combat, all this stuff, you go. This, so your time in CPD is just piling on to everything else yeah, at that point. Okay. A, and then, like, the fact that I work in one of the most dangerous communities in the country, in the city, let alone the country, doesn't help. You know, I mean, sh- there's things that just just eat at you, eat at you a little bit. You know, you want to always try to help people, you know, arrest the bad guy. But uh, when you see kids burned and hidden away, or you see fucking one-year-old shot, these things 
slowly tear at you. Well, I don't think that there's any worse thing for us as first responders where it's, it's police, medics, firemen. There's nothing worse than kids. No, that's, that's there, for there me. Is, there's that nothing worse. Me the and, most. and that's not just you, Joe. That's yeah. across the board. Absolutely. You know, if you were to ask the stupid question that civilians ask us is, what's the worst thing you've ever seen? First of all, don't ask that question. Don't ask, those, yeah. don't ask the people who live that nightmare to relive it yeah. for your entertainment. Don't ask that question. But, you know, I never considered it like that. Yeah, that, but, that, that, you know, it, 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 is, though, you know? it is always going to be that pediatric, that kid that you saw. There's something, it, if, if we were going to answer that question truthfully that we don't want to answer, it's going to have to do with something with a kid. Yeah, you know? for sure. So, you know, we, we all know where you're coming from with that, and you're piling that out on top of your other stuff. That's a that's a pretty heavy burden to, to carry. Yeah. So, how did you, you know, maybe there's somebody who's who's listening to that that's that weight starting to get a little heavy for them. What advice do you got for them to help them get to the other side of that? That's a tough one, you know, because if somebody, because when my it's a tough one because when you're in that spot. You're not thinking about how you're going to get out of it. You're thinking about how it's going to stop. But how did I get out of it is what I can p- pass along. Yeah. You just wake up, you take a shower, you get up at a somewhat decent hour. When the things are the worst, focus on yourself. You're, you're self-living. Don't think about nothing else. You get up at, you know... Fuck, man, I've been, you know, and it's not been too long. I mean, like, I'm still going, you know, all this shit is not like, hey, this happened, now right. I'm great. Oh, yeah, this is right. a I'm clear of that. Yeah. turnover stuff. So recently, you know, you, I got three kids now, you know, and then uh, when stuff starts getting bad for me, everybody knows, and I know, and it's kind of like, you know, my dad's Friday <laughs> paycheck thing. Oh, they know yeah. dad is... And then, you know, you start sleeping late. You start not caring. You start not this. But you got to start. You got to st- And this is the same thing, like, when, this is what I learned in the Army. One, I, on my own in the Army, not like some, some tent type of Army training. With that Special Forces thing, and that's why I always draw back to that. It was one of the best experiences in my life because there was a time in the Special Forces training, they tell you before, okay, if you lose your gun, automatically gone. If you lose your way, automatically gone. This They get these strict rules. And there was one day, and I was a fucking kid from the city, you know, so I didn't know nothing. So I, I'll i tell you, it's like, okay, you got to get these certain points on a map, and then this is how you show you're a badass. You find it, you go and get it. You know, you got your objectives, all this stuff. I was not a map dude. I could not find my way out of a fucking forest with this. Mm-hmm. So, but you had to figure out how to do it. So that, here's what I did. They gave me my map, put in the thing. I start walking at nighttime. It was, it was a nighttime thing. So I immediately was lost in the, like some kind of brush that was taller than I was. <laughs> and I was like, oh, what the fuck am I supposed to do? Any way I go, I couldn't find my way out. I'm trying to, th- and you have this pack that's like 60 pounds. You're trying to throw it and I'm stuck. I was like, well, now what the fuck do I do? I'm going to get kicked out of here. And then I got oh, to, you man, know, you got to be in so much trouble. <laughs> no, it's not trouble, but it's yeah. like, you ain't going to be part of this if you can't figure out what to do. So I didn't, I'm like, okay, well, I got to wait here till it's light outside at least. So I can see. So I, it, I wait till it's light. I can see. And I can see that this is higher. This is higher. I have no idea where I am, man. So I go out a pet. I was like, well, I got to get out of here. So I get out of here. And then, uh, so my map. And I have no idea still. I was like, well, well, this doesn't fucking make sense to me. I don't know where I'm at. I'm lost, though. I said, okay, well, I see some water over here. So I go, and I see a water on the map. So I was like, if I follow this water up to this point, I'll be back on track. So I go, start going through the water, and it's a stream. It's like up to my ankles. I was like, ah, this is cool. I'm going to be back on track in a minute. Within two steps, the water goes to my ankles to my neck. 
<laughs> and I fall. My pack goes. That's just all my supplies Jesus. and my food and everything. This is going to be a days long mission. And then, you know, I'm now in raging water that's up to my neck. And I'm trying to hold on to my pack, trying to hold on to a branch that I can't get out of. I was like, okay, well, okay, what am I going to do now? I'm fucking stuck here. And then somebody comes out of the, like, during that training, nobody can help each other. You help each other, you're both out. Somebody comes and says, hey, you need help. I said, well, yeah, I need help. I'm stuck over here. Said it calmly, man. And then I looked back, and the guy was gone. I was like, what the fuck was that? Why would he come out and say, you need help here? Now he's left. Later on, I find out it because he was somebody who was observing me the whole time and seeing that I was dying, came to observe if I was actually dying. And I calmly stated, yeah, no, I need help. And he's like, nah, he's good. You know? <laughs> so I'm over here. I was like, okay, so what am I going to do? And then I could see the path of the river ahead. So I was like, okay, I'll throw my bag to the side and I'll try to find a way to drag myself out of this deep ass river. So I do, I throw my bag to the side drag myself out of the deep ass river. Now my bag weighs like 300 pounds because it's everything soaking wet. And then, but you know, you still have to keep going. So I take all, and then at this point I was like, well, now I know I'm fired. I'm done. So I take the shit out of my bag. I start to drain it off, drain all the water out of a sleeping bag or whatever else, clothes, all this stuff, drain it out, put it back in my bag. There's a fucking snake comes by me. They're like, water snakes are poisonous. Don't fuck with them. I, he comes right by me, stops. I said, I'm not fucking with you, man. I'm thinking in my head, I don't want to fuck with this snake. And he looks at me, goes on about his business. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? This guy's f- having a rough day. I know. I was like, what is going on here? This is not ridiculous. even the snake gave you the time. <laughs> yeah. I was like, okay, well, I know I'm out of here. At least I'm going to look like a fucking man about it. That's what I was thinking. Oh. So I get my shit together. I go... I shave. I remember I clean myself up. And then like a fucking bitch, what you got to do when, when you're lost or whatever, you got to stand by the side of a road and blow a whistle. I lost. And then another thing, too. I was looking at the map. Well, when I, before I started getting lost, you got your gun, whatever. I set my gun down. I'm looking at the map. If you lose your gun, you're automatically gone, you know. So I'm looking at the map. I'm looking this way. Walk in the middle of a woods. I've never been in the middle of a woods like that. You know, I turn around. My gun's gone. I'm like fuck, where was I? And then I right, retrace my steps. Can't find the gun anywhere. Try to go forward. Fall in the water. Lose all my shit. Oh my Everything's God. wet. My map is fucking disintegrated because it's paper. And I was like, well, I fucked up now. <laughs> and then the, the, but the thing that they said is if you, if you are all this shit's going on, you will for sure get kicked out if you don't stand by the road and blow a whistle. So you feel like a punk. I felt like a punk, I should say. Standing by the road, blowing a whistle. Like, I'm lost. Help me. Whistle. Oh, God. Help me. Whistle. Some guy comes in a pickup truck. He's like, hey, you're lost, huh? I said... <laughs> Yeah, man, yeah. I'm lost. He's like, ah, throw your shit in the back. So I throw my shit in the back. He lets me in the cab of the truck. I didn't, I'm the first one there. So we go around. He drives around. He's this, he turns out he's like the special forces guy that is a liaison to, he was an important guy, whatever the fuck. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. So he's like, hey, you know, Joe, just don't give up. You're doing, uh, you're doing all right. I was like, what the fuck do you know? I just lost everything. <laughs> he's like, hey, no, you're doing fine. No big deal. And then everybody in the back of the truck is like, oh, he gets to sit in the front. I'm like, I have no idea what the fuck is going on at this point. But I learned. And then, I, you know, I got to the, the, there's a rally point or whatever. And uh, I'm going, no map, no gun. My shit's fucking 300 pounds. And they're like, do you want to quit? I said, no. Because that's the way you get, that's one of the ways you get out. You can quit. You can quit. They're like, you can quit. And they're like, Joe, you're I mean, thinking, your bag's 300 pounds. You have no gun. You have no map. You're fucked. And they're like, Joe, do you want to quit? I said, no. And they're like, all right, go. And they let me stay. And I eventually got selected. Wow. So they were going to have to kill me to get me out of that thing. That's yeah. what I was thinking. I was like, I'm not quitting. You know, you want to get rid of me? Get rid of me. But I fucked up all that shit, and I'm going to keep trying. Right. And I bring that. If I'm, if I'm in control of my own destiny... I ain't going anywhere. Right. And that's what I bring now to 
my destiny. But what it takes, like for people going through PTSD or thinking about suicide, you have to know that you're in control of that and don't quit. It's going to get better. It's hard to know when you're like going through that. Sorry. It's hard to know when you're like going through it, but it goes. It get you get through it if right. if you don't stop. Right. You know, don't quit. That's all. Yeah. No, the the the, the days there's always uh, there's always some around the corner, and like for people to you know not realize. Oh, sorry. Um, you know, for for people to not see that there's that you know there's that corner, there's that street, there's that there's that light at the end, like. Um, so yeah, what do you, what do you think, mean, Vinny? Take I mean, a break. Oh, you could have you could have quit right then and there. They gave you the out. You were you you and lost you know, everything. A lot at of that guys point. did quit. A lot of guys yeah. did quit. They're like, right. well, I fucked up. No, I'm but done. I, I just don't think that you know they they had the same desire that you had. And if you have the desire to get to the other side, you know, I think you can do it. And you know, you're a perfect example that this is what you wanted to do. Things were looking pretty bad for you. You you lost everything on that that land nav course. That's what and, it was, the land nav course. And <laughs> you made it through. Um, I think the lesson there for that you're trying to relate to other people who might be carrying a little heavier burden these days is that just keep fighting to get to the to the end. Just don't that give things, up. Yet. That things get don't better, give up right? Yet. Don't give up yet, because like since then. Things have been shitty from time to time, and it gets close. Like, what the fuck am I even doing? And it doesn't help. Like, oh, what about your kids? It doesn't help. Like, oh, man, you got so much going on. That doesn't help. But what helps is you have to know, I have to know that if I hang around long enough, it's going to be better. And that's what, you know, I hope to pass on to other people, you know. That's pretty powerful information, um, considering everything that you've been through. And, you know, you're, where you work is about as bad as it gets for a police officer or any other first responder. We're back. We took a little break, and uh, we're here with uh, Doge. <laughs> <laughs> Doge Apeshlin. <laughs> Joe, Joe D. D. Plushen. Joey D. Who is... And we're here with buttery leather Corey Lieber. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just just to bring us back a little bit, I I want to um, talk a little bit about uh, our our friend Dan Trader had brought us aware of this uh, um, of this website that's called WarriorsHeart.com. Um, we just want to remind if if there's firefighters out there, law enforcement, active duty, um, veterans of the military, EMTs, paramedics. Um, Warrior's Heart is a is a beautiful company that has been, or a beautiful operation that's been helping helping all of these people throughout, especially throughout this COVID nineteen crisis. They've got twenty four seven support um, support line available, and that number is eight 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 three seven eight one four seven four. You can visit them on their website, which again is Warrior's Heart. Dot com. Um, and again, they've got, they've got testimonials on there. They've got some great resources. They show their facilities and, and programs that they have. Um, again, once we, I mean, we were, we were definitely focusing on, on achieving one certain goal when we were sitting down with Dan Trader. But uh, <laughs> after, yeah. after looking into this program, it's, it, it's incredible. Yeah. If doing. you're, if you have any inkling that you might need help, Definitely reach out. And if you don't want to reach out to them, reach out, go to your church, reach out to a friend. But like Joe was saying, get to the next day, make it to the day after that, and things will get better. But the being able to recognize that you need some help is the biggest thing. We can, you know, Warrior's Heart, you, it, uh, Dan Trader recommended it. He's had some And, and that's really that, all you need to know. That's all you honest. really need to know. <laughs> Uh, and if you're feeling the weight of that, feeling the weight of the world on you right now, just reach out to them. You know, there's no obligation. There's no, 
it, it doesn't cost you a thing to reach out to them and just ask for some help. If you busted your ankle or you busted your arm, it doesn't mean that you're weak, but you have to fix it. And the same if you have mental health you're broken and you need somebody to fix you. You need some help. So doesn't mean that, that you're a weak person. It doesn't mean that you're soft, but you need to get it fixed and that's it. Yeah. So and, and warrior's he, heart. And again, that's, that's not just, uh, not just your classic, um, uh, classic PTSD, but they also deal with substance abuse. Um, ironically enough, alcohol abuse, um, <laughs> on the website, they've got some pretty cool, um, some pretty cool resources on like signs to look for treatment. Um, and it, they'll go through like some insurance stuff to kind of see what they can do to help you out. But again, they're, they're the resources of these guys. It's just incredible from what I've seen. So definitely check them out. Can I mention something to you guys? Yeah, please Joe. The voices. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Is it, uh. No, you're good. Yeah, you're good. Okay. You're yeah. perfect. So I remember a couple times when I was in the pits and I was thinking about, like, you know, I was thinking about suicide for sure. <sighs> and I wanted to get out of it. Okay. I can't talk to the EAP be for the Chicago Police Department, which I probably could have and I should have because I don't want them to – have something on me. Yeah, I don't want. About, yeah, right. yeah. I don't want. There's a trust there issue there. Yeah, yeah. I, and then like I, my friends, my regular friends, I don't want them to know that I have something going on. So I don't talk to my regular. So I try to reach out to some other people that are kind of my friends that I think I can trust. And these motherfuckers don't know what I'm talking about. They're like, "Why are you calling me?" <laughs> and like, Just like non-cop friends, not well, like, cops, non-cops. Yeah. Well, like I try to like. Reach out to people that would. I was like, okay, I saw these people have posted stuff about cops that have committed suicide, but I'm not ready to say I'm thinking about committing suicide. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it's a weird so, neighborhood to be in because, like, you, like, you're not going to call your mom. You're not going to call your very best friend. Right. But you're not going to call a stranger. Well, I'm a tough guy. I'm a yeah. tough guy. Like, every other man is a tough guy. Right. So, okay, I'm not going to call EAB because they're going to call on me, and then I'm not going to be able to work. Right. I'm not going to call gonna my mom. I'm not going to call this person. So I try to reach out to somebody in a roundabout way, a few people. Yeah. And they look at you like, what the fuck is you calling me? I haven't talked to you in year. And then, like, well, I remember you said... You know, your friend committed suicide, call you anytime, this and that. And I call them and they're like, what in the fuck are you I mean, talking about? Because they're joke, not man. professionals. Right. So you have to deal with somebody like awesome. these guys are talking about. Yeah, no. You have to, I mean, your and friends are and, your friends. Yeah. And those people that say that shit are, do have good intentions. Right. And and that's the beauty of this, like you're saying, Joe. Like it's, it's a nice, you know, you're not, you're not talking to someone that, has a direct relationship to you. You're not talking to someone that is, you know, that's that's a dependent of yours or someone that's, yeah. you know, th that's going to end up having some type of, you know, absolute relationship with you where where what you're saying is going to affect what they're doing. It's it's a 24-hour or it's 24-7 support line where, like, if you are just in, not in a great place, like, again, like, if it, helps just a little bit. I know Vince has said it before. Like, it, I got to say, I, I don't want to talk about how beautiful of a wordsmith you are, Vincent. But, like, <laughs> he, he said it before, like, it, and, and, and it's awesome. Like, when you, if you end up going down with with a, a spur or chip bone in your elbow, you don't think twice about calling Hey, I gotta run the ER, or hey, I gotta, I gotta take myself out of service you for this. You know, you gotta go to an ortho guy, a guy who specialized in putting you back together, right? And that's but exactly something what that's this is. literally that literally could kill you. It's that you stigma. Know, mentally, you know what I mean? Like yeah. it's a stigma that we all. Right. This is like, thankfully, we're on a precipice brink or whatever, yeah. where this stigma is not it's as much it was as it was. 20 years ago, 10 right. years ago, whatever. But we're still dealing with it. I yeah. mean, I know I'm dealing with it. I don't know about everybody, but... Well, we're, try we're trying to bust that stigma. 
Right. You know, we're trying, we're, we're, we're doing our best. We're doing our part. Uh, it's just, as long as I feel that we're at least providing some place to go, if you got, if that weight is getting a little too heavy for you, you know, maybe these guys can help you out. So, uh, warrior's heart, if you need it, it's there. And, you know, just whether you don't, if you don't want to go there, go somewhere, find something, reach out. If you want to send us an email, send us an email to Chicago's Bravest. We'll find somebody for you. 100% we'll find somebody for you. Can I tell you a non-success story that also happened to be a success story or whatever? Yeah, let's hear it, You know what? This is not a fucking hero story, but it's about myself. And then me realizing how to deal with all this shit, you know? I was a cop in Inglewood and deal with bad guys, fight them, try to get guns, try to get... And I was... And I was, and I still am, and I was a good guy, so I'm not gonna do anything stupid. But what happens is you end up getting hurt. I ended up getting hurt, having surgery. So when you're now, I had a surgery. Now I'm away from all the police officers and people that have been there with me. And it's a long process. Like I said, the first time earlier on, it's like six, seven months. This and that. And now my base of support is gone. You know, the people. And, the, you know, they, and my personal relationships deteriorate. Yeah, and, and I, you know, it never really dawned on me that, you know, when you get hurt, you're away from the people that get you. Yeah. There's got to be some sense of isolation when you're with the people who... that. That group of people who actually get you as, you know, as being a first responder, that that group gets smaller and smaller as the years as the yeah, years go on, right? For sure, for sure. So when you're taken away from that, you're increasing that isolation. So getting hurt, man, I never thought about the fact that that the sends you in, yeah, sends you into a deeper sense of isolation that you that you already have. And it's not anybody's fault. It's these people go on with their lives. They work. They go continue. Now you're doing your own thing. But, like, for me, I was like, well, I was part of this. Now that thing is gone, and now I'm on my own. So I'm dealing with all this stuff on top of everything else that I spoke about earlier, and that shit just starts to spiral out of control. Uh, so, but you... <laughs> still got kids you still have to you know take care of everything yeah life goes on joe yeah life yeah. goes on and you got to do what you got to do well speaking of life going on you and i we have the ability to sh- say that we were part of a muddied chicago history that we were both part of the riots that happened um over the summer here and i know that uh when things went south downtown, from being from Inglewood, how many miles would you say Inglewood is from downtown? Oh, maybe five, seven, eight, yeah. ten. Yeah. So it far reached to you guys where you guys had to be called in because they were basically like, "Hey, downtown's was, up for grabs." That was the only. It was all time, hands on deck. Like, say a ten-one is a, the the most you know important police emergency. Ten so, one. so ten one for people who are listening, and that goes for us too. Our, we have ten one, and a ten one is your life is in jeopardy. You feel like you're about to die. You need every anybody who can hear your voice calling for the ten one, and the alarm office is going to send the cavalry. Right. So it's reserved for life threatening emergencies. Yeah, and they only usually do it in the district in the surrounding, possibly. You know right. what I mean? Well, people who can get to you in time. Right. This was a citywide 10-1, and I'd never heard that. Not that I've been a cop forever, but there was a citywide 10-1. They are like, anybody who is not doing something, you need to come downtown. We're getting overrun. And that's what we did. The first night of the riots, we went there. We went downtown. Well, I mean, and you know what? There's a thing between uh, protest and riot. A hundred percent. This was not a protest. No, there was 
I mean, like, I'm going to speak on behalf of the riots because that's what I dealt with. I didn't, I dealt with protests later on, but riots was when they called us all. They're like, this, the central heart of Chicago is being overrun by rioters. We need everybody downtown. And that's what that message was. And we went downtown on that first night. We did what we had to do. We cleared people out. But by the time you guys got down there and right when I got down there too, there were police cars already burning. There were already the the high rises already being broken into, looted. Uh, it was just, uh, I described it in previous podcasts as it was Gotham City Absolutely. when the bad guys took over. Absolutely. That's exactly what it looked like. Papers, every, it was... It was the most surreal thing that I've ever been to, and you know, in my it was the one time in my career that I felt unsafe because, and here I am with an army of police officers, and we were somewhere at like LaSalle and uh, I don't know, like just just west of Michigan Avenue, I'll say, and. They put the bridges up, so we had no means of egress back. It was neither this, it you're, forward you're into the here. crowd. Right? <laughs> yeah, right. It was neither into the crowd or into the river. And so, yeah. when I, here I am with an army of police officers and nowhere to go and severely outnumbered. I, I, can't, I, I still can't fathom where all these people came from, but in an army of police officers... I had that that feeling of being unsafe, and that was the first time I ever felt that in my whole career, um, especially under those conditions. It, it wasn't an issue of protest because um, we've been to protests before. I know you have, and I have too. In a protest, you have a message that you're trying to bring awareness to. You're trying to send a message. You're trying to make people aware of an issue. That wasn't this. This was people busting into shops, stealing shoes, taking electronics to, I mean, really, uh, uh, crimes of opportunity for most of what was going on down there. Did you have the same sense that that was with you? Well, absolutely. Like what the, you know, I'm going to, I'm not going to get into why the protest started or who in, initiated the stealing. But when I got down there and when you were down there, there was no like, it wasn't protest. It was riots. There were people just there to steal, and that's fine. So I'll tell you my experience. If that's fine. We went down there with this guy, our sergeant. His name was uh, is still Sergeant Cortese. He was the best sergeant that I've ever had to be involved with. And we got down there, and he's like, I don't even know if we were supposed to be down there, but... We were guys from Inglewood, and we know how to deal with these thousand hundred people um, riots because that's every summer in Inglewood. So we go down there, and then he's marching us like freaking riot guys up and down Michigan Avenue, uh, trying to lock people up. And then, you know, everybody is trying to get order. All the cops are trying to get order, and he's using the things that helped him during uh, the things that happened. I can't remember what it's called. Like, they had uh, the G8 summits and all that shit. So they're doing the riot stuff like that. I wasn't around during that, but he was. So he's using that knowledge, and we're, like, pushing people back. So And then we're, like, free agents pushing people back over here, getting the people, and they're just stealing and they're just breaking the store, stealing. We're grabbing them, uh, and that's all night. Finally, times come to come home. Things are calming down on the first night. The first night, the police have a little bit of control. Things are calming down. Everything's going back to normal. We start to go back, and these people wave us down. They're like, this car keeps coming back. They keep going to the store, you know. Can you guys help us? We're already trying to go home, but like, yeah, we're going to help you for sure. So we, we go, we follow the car, 
tries to get away. We ended up catching him. Got a gun. He's robbing people all night long. We get him. They, the city charges him with, you know, because, oh, no, we can only charge, uh, what was it? Criminal damage or something whatever. like that. Yeah, yeah whatever, whatever, some bullshit. So, like, hey, if you guys want to have witnesses, hey, you guys can go ahead and, you know, charge them with the felony or whatever. But okay. So all night long, we're locking people up. We're from Inglewood, so we, tr- and we're a kind of a tight knit group. So we're trying to, we are arresting people on probable cause for serious felonies, and they're like, nah, we're gonna, you know, just charge them with trespassing, or whatever. I was like, how the fuck are you gonna charge somebody with trespassing when they're breaking into the store and we catch them inside the store? And but that's what it was. Uh, but that was not sorry about that that was not the worst part the worst part was the days to come that first night second night of the riots we were just battling people downtown and you know what and I've said this before if you are unhappy with you know criminal justice system which is I it's it's understandable because you know African American people people of color have dealt with the raw end of the criminal justice system. So I understand that. If you're going to protest, you're going to do this shit downtown, makes sense. But the next days and weeks were just people destroying little tiny corner stores in Inglewood, burning them down. In their own neighborhoods. In their own neighborhoods. And I just couldn't get back. I just did not understand it. Right. It was just so sad. Like, so all the cops, we had to rally behind the few stores that were, you know, a little bit bigger. You know, there was no, you know, there's no jewels in Inglewood. There's no fucking Whole Foods. Well, there is a Whole Foods, but, and well, we did protect that. Yeah. But sh- for the most part, there's like little staple places where they go. So we had to protect those, and we had to station cops on those stores. So people wouldn't go in. I was like, this is ridiculous. This is not a protest. This is just all out looting. We actually got done with a podcast <clears throat> here, and I just moved. And I'm like, like the dorky white guy, I'm going to take North Avenue home to my Wait, Was that the place. day I rode my bike here? It you're, might have been. You're looking at your phone going, hey, uh, you guys, ri- riots are yeah. going on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I'll like, tell you the same thing. I, on my way to work the second day, I was like, are you guys aware there's a lot of people breaking into Walgreens? They're like, yeah, Joe. And, like, I was on my way to work as a cop. They're like, yeah, Joe, just get here, man. We'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> right. We got bigger problems with Walgreens yeah. right now, Joe. Uh, yeah, no, it was nuts. Like, it was just, I just remember cruising down North Avenue, and it was just bedlam. They're, like, all of a sudden, like, just three, four cars would stop and just roll liquor store. Yeah. Um, I remember there were, you know, probably a dozen cars, like, just ripping east with, like, holding holding TVs on top of their cars. Yeah. And I'm like, and oh. We're, we're talking about this, like, this was, you know, years ago, back <laughs> right. in no, the day. No, it was this a few is, weeks, yeah. months ago. Right. right. We, <laughs> this, is, we, this is measured in months. I don't know if I'm glad to be a part of that history in Chicago. But it definitely is a black it's, eye on the city. It yeah. was it was just a bad situation. I think you know, and in you know, my honest opinion was it was a good idea. The intention started off well, you know, like you were saying, Joe. If if you want to protest and there's some injustice going, I'll stand behind you. I'll be with you 100. percent I'll support your right to protest. There's but then no it, it went it went way is, past that. Right. There's no doubt. Right. Um, unfortunately, you know, and, and again, barring all politics from things like, unfortunately, violent protesting does not counter, you know, racial injustices. It with, definitely with doesn't bring prison. you to your side and, of your argument. Yeah, like it, it, yeah. it doesn't. It, and again, like like you said, Joe, there's there's plenty of examples of, of bad situations, but violent protesting doesn't hurt anybody, especially, I mean, not, not to say kind of, you know, 
adventure out, but like, especially in your community, <laughs> yeah, like it, it definitely doesn't seem to do. Um, so I'm Joe, What's I'm up? sorry, pal. Go I'm ahead. Gonna, I'm going to hit you with some hit it. This, I almost fucking cried, <laughs> which if anybody knows me, I'm a fucking sociopath. But like when I read this, Joe, I, Jesus Christ. So, um, Something that, something that happened to uh, Joe, just to kind of give everyone an idea of the kind of guy that he is. Um, I'm going to take a little excerpt of, uh, of something that, that um, he put up not too long ago where, uh, where he says, um, my partner and I were literally 30 to 60 seconds behind as we chased down the shots and car accidents that led us to the hospital where a baby was murdered today. Um I saw a regular car in the ambulance port with bullet holes in multiple places. I saw all the blood in the back seat, and I knew that a baby was in bad shape. I was the first one in the doctor's as the as he pressed two fingers on his on his small chest to do CPR. Um, I saw his mother try to gather her thoughts as she worried about her head wound. Um, the baby's father was outside grieving his wounded son. As I as I would if my son were shot. I didn't have the heart to tell him that his son was gone. Um, so as he angrily taunted me, I grabbed him and hugged him. He hugged me back for a brief time, then he head butted me in the cheek because he was a gangster who had to show strength in front of his other, his other gangsters gathering around. Um, then I went to the, the shot spotter, started everything, and I found a homeless person who told me where the shots came from. We then went and found casings and shut down the street. He was one year old. So, again, Joe, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to drop that on you, but just to kind of summarize the kind of guy that we're talking to today. Um, it, not only is is this guy a professional, a, a, a true professional, but showing showing that lighter side and the emotion with people who are actively taunting you um for for doing your job for all intents and purposes while while trying to to show that community outreach and then afterwards i still have a job to do and you and you get back on the street and, and you did what you had to do did you ever catch that guy joe the long story on that yeah. one. All right. Well, why don't we save that one for our next time we, we come on in here? All right? So with, with that being said, I would rather end this podcast on a happier note. <laughs> so, Joe, in your time on the police department, you guys ever play jokes on each other? I do. <laughs> <laughs> I know you had it in you, buddy. <laughs> I know you had it in you. Give us one. What? So yeah. So like that's our thing. I mean, you know, like that's our thing. We always <laughs> fuck with each other. Okay. Always Here's, bust uh, each other's phones. All right. I'm see, sure I got I a couple. How you from... CPD guys roll? Well, yeah. shit. No. Here's a friend of mine. <laughs> I'll tell you. Um, we both kind of at the same time. We're both like. Badass dudes, we talk to each other. He's gonna be a SWAT guy. He's gonna be this, that. Yeah. And then I convinced him that there's a secret ninja training. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, can't tell nobody. But there's a training. That if the, you talk about, it, you're out. Right. <laughs> Chicago never. has a training that they will teach you to be a ninja. <laughs> Me growing up, I used to watch American Ninja. I don't know if you guys did or whatever, but uh, I told like, like the American Gladiators. No, talking? American Ninja. It's a it's a show. Ninja. It's a movie or whatever. So I was like, listen, all you got to do, you put a two from in to the commander that you want to be a ninja, <laughs> and they'll get it. They'll know what's up. Don't. <laughs> you <know>. So. <laughs> So it's like, don't worry about it. You get it? It's like a secret thing. You'll go to ninja school, and you'll be a badass. <laughs> They're like, why don't you go, Joe? Why don't you want to be a ninja? I'm like, you know what? 
I got kids. I'm like, you about know. that intro life right now, <laughs> yeah, right. buddy. <laughs> I want to be. I'm just, that's not, that's not me right now. I got kids. <laughs> so I got this guy to put the the forms in. In his to, official form. Like, yeah. our, our form too is the, your official to from. Right. right. They put that forms, he put the forms in to go to ninja school <laughs> quietly. Dear sir. <laughs> yeah, right. sir, sir or ma'am. <laughs> I know that ninja school is in my future. I know it's a secret. I, I feel like I'm qualified for, I feel like I'm qualified for ninja school based on these. So, so what was the outcome of his his form? Uh, the, they called me into the office. Like, what the fuck are you? Why are you fucking? Talk about this ninja shit again, Joe. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> This is the tenth form we've got. Yeah, Joe. Why do you submit everybody to ninja school? I don't understand it. But Wait, I mean, we might have to open a fucking ninja unit right. now based on right. all these applicants. Hey, they didn't say that it didn't exist. Oh yeah, they didn't. Yeah. Did not confirm nor deny. Like I said, I'm a little older, and I, you know, you pick on the younger guys. It's like 24, 25. It's like, listen, dude, you're a ninja. You need to go to ninja school. Don't tell no fucking body about it, okay? <laughs> you start talking about it like you're not even going to get there, dude. Like you're not even going to consider You put that two from in, we'll submit it to the commander, write to the commander. Don't, no lieutenant, something like that. I got uh, connection. He, uh, he, he, he goes, he, he goes above the uh, chain of command to go to Ninja School. That's fucking amazing. Well, I, I would love to end this podcast on Ninja School. Joe, I can't thank you enough. Thank yeah. you so much for bringing thank that you guys for of that, um, having all this stuff. Man. Yeah, no, man. Thanks for hanging it. out and having a glass of whiskey. It was amazing. It honors ours. Um, any closing thoughts here, uh, Corey? No, I mean, I mean, again, we and and this is uh, this is purely my thoughts, but um, you know, I I know that there's a lot of these are charged times. There's a lot of people that have a lot of different thoughts on um, on what the criminal justice system is or should be, on what policing should or, or should not be, um, or, you know, even the existence of it. But um, I, I know what I have in front of me, and that, that's a class act guy who truly cares about the community. He truly cares about doing what's right, about going to work every single day and trying to trying to help as many people as he can. Yeah, and I think Joe and represents the good majority I, of law enforcement. I, and so absolutely. think about what you're vilifying. You're vilifying like good people. So Joe, thank yeah. you. Thank you guys. Thanks I appreciate it. The opinions and views are that of Chicago's Bravest Stories podcast and their guests. They do not necessarily reflect the views of any municipal governments, fire protection districts, fire departments, EMS, or law enforcement organizations.